Good afternoon, everyone, or if you're Robin, good very early morning. Uh, this is Tim Serantonio of Neon One, very excited to present our next uh, part of our webinar series, the Partner Positives webinar series, which uh, is, is kind of exploring the Neon One ecosystem, one expert at a time. And so we're going to be diving into some really great content today uh, with a Neon One certified partner, Robin Cabral. Um, before we do that, just want to go over a few key items. Uh, so on our next slide, uh, what we're going to see is just a little bit about us, uh, Neon One. Uh, with a little bit more of a click, we'll be able to have a beautiful uh, space-themed, uh, there we go, uh, spaceship. We love the space stuff. It gets us excited. And so Neon One putting on this webinar is a technology ecosystem designed for mission-driven organizations like your own. And so we're excited to have you. Uh, we provide a, a few different things in terms of the Neon One ecosystem itself. So on the next slide, just a quick overview of all of the, the things that our uh, generosity ecosystem provides. Uh, Neon CRM is, is something that even some of you may be using today. Uh, several thousand organizations utilize Neon CRM to manage their donors. Uh, members, volunteers, e-communications, and more. And actually, that is indeed what we're going to get a little bit of a concrete uh, dive in after Robin's presentation. I'm going to come at the end and, and say, you know what? We learned a lot of amazing things from Robin today. How does this actually apply to Neon CRM? But Neon One also provides a, a, a bunch of other great stuff that helps round out a wheel of services and software for nonprofits. Civicor which does uh, some of the largest giving days in the world. In fact, we did North Texas Giving Day last week, raised over $50 million in one day. Mm -hmm. But we also do client case management. So if you need HIPAA compliance reporting, VOCA reporting, things of that nature, very sensitive uh, data, these are things that we do uh, and can manage. Uh, but then we also supply a peer-to-peer -peer software called Rallybound, which powers Michael J. Fox Foundation, Cystic Fibrosis, Sierra Club, and more, as well as an arts and ticketing platform called Arts People. Uh, we also are really, really excited because we curate the experts that we work with. So this is uh, not just simply working with somebody who, you know, happen to, to email us and, and say, I'd like to write a blog for you or something like that. We actually... Uh, have a dedicated certification process that Robin has gone through past and I am proud to call her a Neon One <laughs> certified partner because it ensures that folks understand not only their expertise but Neon One's impact as well which has raised over 10 billion dollars to date serving over 30,000 nonprofits. Now final housekeeping item before I hand it on over to Robin is on the next slide with another click. We'll also see that today's presentation is indeed being recorded. Uh, we are going to post this most likely today. I get the, I try to get these turned around very quickly. Um, so we're going to post this to our YouTube channel. Uh, so Neon One has a dedicated YouTube channel for partner webinars. So you can not only check this out, but a few other ones from fellow Neon One certified consultant partners. And uh, of course, we're going to be following up with some, some uh, extra information as well if you want to learn more about what Neon One is up to, as, as well as uh, learning more about Robin, too. Um, so before I hand it on over, I do want to also thank you, Robin, because now what you might know, folks, is now Robin is a master at all things data and donor management, <laughs> but she also is a machine because she is, what time is it where you are right now? Oh, geez, wait a minute. It is 3.05 a.m. <laughs> Robin is speaking to us from Australia, folks. This is an absolute like pleasure <laughs> and treat that she she's doing this for us so i'm really really excited and and i can't wait for you to learn a lot of things so robin i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, uh you know hand it on over to you and really excited okay. to have you here today great well thank you tim and it's actually wednesday morning so i can tell you that you will live to see wednesday because i'm in it already so that's a good thing <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> but, <laughs> But well, thank you, Tim. Welcome, everyone. Just a little bit about myself. I own a small boutique consulting firm in the Northeast United States, even though with a division that's 
going to be happening in Australia. So, um, but I'm a certified fundraising executive. I have a master's in philanthropy and fund development. And one of the reasons that I am so passionate about data is because part of my consulting firm, I actually manage and run in-firm staffing for my clients. So I'm actually digging deep into the databases. And so I see the importance of having um, good, clean, consistent data that you have policies around and uh, the need for that kind. I often run into cases where I'm coming to, into someone's calendar year end and the database is an absolute mess. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Here's our goals and objectives. We are gonna look at what, you know, what is the case, we talk about the case for support for fundraising, but here's the case for having consistent clean data, consistent clean data. That's the key, those are the key words. And then I'm gonna talk about what's really important to me is campaigns, and I'm gonna add in funds and appeals and why, the structure, the internal skeleton of your database. And then you're gonna understand, or we're gonna to understand together how to enter data in so that you can utilize that information effectively, how to clean data, and for me, for me, the importance of the case for a data entry manual. Most folks that I do that I talk to do have don't even have one in place, a data entry manual. But it is absolutely critical for the inevitable hit by a bus example, you know, and that actually happened to me where I didn't have someone hit by a bus, but they had an accident that put them out of work immediately. And so we didn't have standards for data entry, so it was a lesson harder. Um, so he, why do we need, why, number one, why do I need a fundraising database? I work with a lot of small clients and I go in and they say to me, here's my database. And guess what it is? It's an Excel spreadsheet. So folks, Excel is not a database. And in this day and age, and we're gonna get into this in a little bit, you can get a very, very affordable database, just like Neon, um, for, uh, for uh, a affordable price, right? And it will keep your data, um, you'll be able to organize your data and do everything that we're gonna talk about in this webinar. So what can a database do? You know, this is where consistent, clean data actually starts. You know, databases are much more than Excel spreadsheets. They can create, many of them have um, um, can, what I call canned reports, canned queries, um, canned uh, uh, processes, particularly in Neon One's case, that will automate things, processes in, in acknowledgement letters or what have you, um, for you. So creating reports around campaigns, funds, appeals, events, Benchmarking is huge for me. It's a topic that I speak a lot on about having key benchmarks that you're evaluating the effectiveness of your fundraising around. And so a database can quickly allow you to look at your benchmarks, donor retention, donor acquisition, recurring gifts, the number of gifts, quickly so that you can see where you are in terms of your progress to your own goals and industry standards. Um, identifying loyal donors and who may be prospects, running reports that will allow you to show you your top donors, your most loyal and consistent donors, all of those things. And of course, you know, ensure the acknowledgement process satisfies IRIS requirements, and not only that, but shows a lot of donor love. And that's why a database is important. Now I will say, what if a database is too expensive for my budget? I'll say, talk to Tim, <laughs> talk to Tim, because they are no longer, you know, the, the, I won't even name names, but the large software packages that once cost 10, eight, 10, $20,000 a year, there are affordable range of options. And of course, Neon One is center stage being a certified consultant for it. I'm going to say that. You know, quality software lies somewhere between the $400 and $20,000 range, but there are products out there for everyone. And again, again, Excel is not a database, just like a shoebox is not a filing system, okay? Uh, so critical. Um, so here's a, just a little, a little uh, demo sign up. You'll get a preview of Neon One at the end of this, but certainly if you want a full 
demo, which I urge you because Neon One is a very, very unique product. Um, I would urge you to check out this demo and take one. So how do you, this is a big topic for me. How do you organize campaigns, funds, and appeals and why? This is absolutely critical. The first thing that you really need to do when you get to your, uh, get to your new database, move from Excel into a database, is really spend time putting the structure of the database in place first. And the skeleton of that database is what we call campaigns, funds, appeals. Now, every database may have a different name for each of those. Most of them call them campaigns, funds, but appeals could be, um, I've seen them called differently in different uh, software platforms. However, once you have these in place, it is very, very difficult to go back and make changes to the structure of this skeleton, the campaigns, the funds, and appeals. Um, and so getting your database right from the start when it comes to the structure is absolutely essentially critical. So what our campaigns are basically those broad overarching um, really general categories. When we think of campaigns, I think of like three or four of them. Your annual giving campaign, you know, the one that you have every year, and, not, and I'm not referencing your calendar year end, I'm saying your annual giving, everything that encompasses annual giving for the year, so everything. So plan giving um, could be, although I would call that um, an endowment campaign perhaps. And then naturally, some of you may be going through a capital campaign. So in my mind, those are the three or four, there could be a fourth, but those are really the three main campaigns that are overarching in your database. Annual, capital, plan giving, endowment. Now, what are funds? To me, you know, people get confused around when they go to structure their database, and I've been through this process myself. What are campaigns, funds, and appeals? So campaigns are those overarching, broad, general buckets. Funds are, are really, what are they allocated to? So you may have unrestricted, which means kind of, to me, general operating, or here we have unsolicited. You may have restricted funds, right? And so I know accounting purposes, they'll have unrestricted and restricted. That's how you may want to categorize them in your database. However, you may also have, your group may be like a choir school, and you may have um, music funds or uh, music equipment funds. Or if you're a school, you may have scholarship funds. So those are very restricted, purpose-driven funds that you would catalog within your database. Now, I want to caution you and say you don't want to run rampant with um, putting everything in there, meaning, yes, un unsolicited is unsolicited, restricted can be just restricted, and you may just want to have a few very important funds and then just put everything else as restricted. If you don't have the volume of donations coming in, maybe just put a, um, a note in the file or the record what the restriction is. Because I have seen databases that have fund after fund after fund, and they may only have one or two donations in them. So be very cautious around um, looking at the volume that goes into what you would constitute as a fund. Now, appeals. For me, appeals, when I ask the question, what prompted this gift? What are the solicitation methods we use to get this gift, right? So some categories may include, you know, you may have had a specific mailing, so for me, fall appeal, and I would categorize these in my database even further and say fall appeal 2019, fall appeal 2018, um, you know, any other kind of campaign mailing that you may do, um, something like the capital campaign mailing would be restricted to the capital campaign fund. But um, so those are, you would ask yourself, what prompted this gift? What strategy do we use? Phonathon, 2019, 2020. Um, golf tournament is another example, spring auction. Um, so that's the difference between 
a campaign, the overarching, the fund, if you're unrestricted, restricted, and then if you have high volume funds like scholarship funds, and then appeals, how, what brought that money in? So getting this right, and I, I'm kind of belaboring the point, but um, really this demonstrates where will the fundraising money be used, right, for funds, scholarship funds, restoration funds, unrestricted, and if an event or appeal is recurring, again, I would recommend that you put you know, calendar year-end campaign 2020 or 2019. Um, I cannot um, talk enough about campaigns, funds, and appeals because I have gone into so many databases that have been structured wrong or incorrectly, let me say, and it is very hard to go back into that database in the middle of a fiscal year and change all of that it becomes impossible. And then it makes comparative analyses to look at your fundraising metrics even more difficult because to run those reports that, um, that are not aligned to campaigns, funds, and appeals, um, and, and once you start to change this midstream, becomes very, very difficult. So if you do not have a database um, and you are looking for one, be very cautious when you start around structuring your campaigns funds and appeals. It's got to start there. So um, we look at annual appeals and I say don't lose your donors before they open the envelope, right? There are a couple of things you can do to organize your campaign and, and appeals appropriately. I highly recommend that you run your data, your database through what is called the National Change of Address, NCOA. Most of you have probably have heard of that. I would recommend that you do it before, if you can, before every major appeal that goes out that's direct mail related, um, or at least once a year. Um, and so basically, many data systems or mail houses, either or, if you're working with a database system or mail house, will provide that NCOA either as part of their package or at a small cost. But the postal, um, it, it's in order to meet postal regulations as well, and it certainly is worth it to keep your data clean. That is one step. I mean, you do not want to sense, and what I mean by don't lose your donors before they open the envelope. Why? Because 50% of people pay more attention to direct mail than to any other marketing channel. Those of you who think that direct mail may be dead, it is not. It's still a very viable, um, ac um, not acquisition, but appeal method. Um, and the fact is, is that nothing is worse than getting something mailed to you. And, you know, instead of spelling your name uh, Robin Cabral, it's Robin Cabral with a K or something like that, and you will immediately lose your donors before they even open that envelope. Talk about teaser text on an envelope uh, for an appeal letter that will work the opposite. Now, this is even worse. I mean, nothing is worse than mailing to a donor who equally has passed away. So um, NCOA will catch some of that. And there are also some other resources here that you can use to clean your data. So like the Social Security Death Index, SS, I hate talking about death, don't we? SSDI, but you, know, you don't wanna be mailing to folks that are deceased or have passed away. So here are some online links that you can use for that Social Security Death Index. Here's one, Ancestry.com, Genealogy Bank, Family Search. You can do that, but an NCOA, um, a national change of address will catch many of those because of course, um, if someone is deceased, they may not have a forwarding address um, and their family might have removed them from the mail stream. Not in all cases though, so you wanna be due diligent around that. Here are other times to remove a donor from a general mailing and I'm gonna add some caveats here. Immediately following a significant gift um, one of the things that I've done some reading about on blogs lately, and I hope that you all subscribe to blogs um, for fundraising best practices, but is the fact that um, even though a major donor has made a gift, don't take them out of your mail stream. 
However, in this case, the word immediately following a significant gift may warrant you from removing them from that general mail stream. But I caution and say, they still need to get your stewardship mailings and those kinds of things. Um, sometimes, see how I put sometimes there, following a large campaign pledge as well, equally the same thing with a gift. However, um, and I'm not gonna get into strategy, but I am. Um, however, I'm working with a, ca a capital campaign right now that is still gonna go forward with um, soliciting its um, donors for annual funds because you still need to keep the lights on. So that you're asking for um, annual funds at the calendar year end. However, there is a case where I say all of the time, this needs to be tracked in your donor base. If someone indicates to you that they do not want to receive mail or do not want, do not want to be solicited, you need to be able to track that kind of information in your database and code those records so that you are not mailing or soliciting those folks. Um, that's, that's a non-negotiable right there. You want to honor your donor preferences and, and what they're asking, and a good database system will allow you to do that. Um, now, that doesn't mean that you can't contact those in, individuals ever. It just means that you have to honor their preference, their communication preferences, and a good donor base will track that. So they may be contacted, but you need to strategize how to do that on your own. Um, and decide with staff or whomever how to do that. So understand how to enter data so that you can utilize the information effectively. What do you want your data to do? And this is where this separates out the Excel spreadsheets from you know, a full force database. Entering data in, and this is where the name garbage in garbage out, where I came up with that, Tim and I, really what you put in is what you're going to get out. And so if you do not enter it in correctly to begin with, you are not going to accurately be able to pull the reports to be able to benchmark yourself, analyze your effectiveness, and then determine accurate future strategy, fundraising strategy around. Okay, so this is critical. Now, I am going, I'm gonna tell you a little story, but it's your data, you own it, protect it. There are a couple of things here. Only trained development staff should enter donor data. Trained, trained. And that's where when we talk about at the end, a manual is important because a manual will allow you to train your development staff so that everyone is entering in data consistently. And while it's not here on this slide, make sure you have a backup trained person to your database in case something happens to that, that, the initial person. Data has to be entered consistently and properly. I just said why, so that you can accurately pull data to do comparative analysis reports, um, looking at your metrics and benchmarking yourself. If you don't enter in data, it can be very costly. It can be hair pulling for the person who comes in like the consultant next. <laughs> um, so there's can be a lot of wasted time and lost effort. What I will see now is a lot of people scrambling, looking at their database before their calendar year end solicitation goes out and going, oh my gosh, I gotta manually fix these because they're noticing all kinds of error. And they really don't have the time at that point to be able to go in and make those fixes quickly. Now, every, including NEON, their, their consultant certification training was out of sight. It was so good. Um, but they also offer training by NEON, but also by any vendor that you have and take advantage of them. Um, I'm constantly pointing my clients back to their software training to say, here it is, learn it, teaching a, I don't know the word, the phrase, teaching a person how to fish, not fishing for them. Um, but check out Neon CRM software. They are probably one of the best, and that's why I'm here and affiliated with them. Now, train, 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 anyone who uses the database or enters data 
Remember that donor information is highly confidential. I do not recommend, and I'm gonna share a story of a board member or any other volunteer entering data. It's inappropriate um, in my eyes. And um, someone who really is not vested in your data could take shortcuts and get kind of loose with data entry. I had a client um, oh, about a year ago, perhaps, and uh, when I did a development audit for them, and uh, when I audit a fundraising program, I do look at the database and data entry and data policies and all of those things. And I said, so, who, um, so who's doing your data entry? And she's, she said, well, a volunteer. A volunteer? Where is she doing it? She does it at her home. She does it at her home. So that data, that very sensitive donation data, was traveling out of the office to someone's home. Who knows what was happening to the confidential donor data once it reached that person's home. We can only hope that it was returned or shredded or something, hopefully not shredded because you need that for your files. But um, it, there was no data control over this person. Um, they weren't trained in the position. They were doing this all off-site and um, talk about uh, breaching confidentiality by carrying donor data everywhere with you, bad, bad, bad. So have best practices around protecting your data, who enters it, how are they trained, how is that donor information kept confidential, how do you handle it, all of those things need to be thought through. But I can't emphasize enough that it really needs to be someone who is in-house a staff person who is trained and this is part of their function. I mean, that's where data consistency starts. So how else can you ensure that data is utilized most effectively and ensure that consistency of data entry? Again, have a procedure for entering data. We're gonna be looking at the importance of a manual. Make sure that proper salutations are used, right? And, um, when I, I created a, a, a data um, a process procedure manual for a client of mine years ago, and that's where I kind of got on this bandwagon about data um, because their database was an absolute shambles when I walked in, I, I looked at and said, okay, you know, the Postal Service, the U.S. Postal Service has some processing, I would call the, I don't know if I'd call them requirements or standards that will ease the transmission of post postage throughout the system. So if you go online and you look for what are the US, well, I don't know, I should be looking at the Australian ones, I guess, but what are the US postal processing requirements for mail to speed it up? Because if you address mail correctly, according to the postal service, um, your mail will get delivered quicker. So there are standards on how you use abbreviations for streets. And interestingly enough, I'm on, um, in Australia, they use uh, things called parade. So I'm on Mitchell Parade, <laughs> not a street or a road. So how do you use those abbreviations for um, your mail piece and document this so that every person who uses the database comes in and uses ST, all caps or small, you know, small ST, uh, capital S, small T, whatever your standards are going to be, they're documented and everyone knows so that the data comes out all the same. Now, I would highly recommend that you also regularly update contact information, email addresses, telephone numbers, and please, please, please stay away from nicknames unless that's the donor's preference, but use full names whenever possible. Um, you need to look at and say, now, nowadays databases, particularly NEON, is so customizable that you can enter in your own fields. So take a look at and determine what data do you need to have? What is useful for your organization? Do an assessment of your data. What would you like to know? Um, for me, I wanna know what's their preferred method of contact. 
what, how often do they want to be contacted? If they have some kind of voluntary history with your organization, how do you get this? You know, this isn't part of this particular webinar, but things like donor surveys, when you're meeting with donors and you're sitting down with one-on-one -on -one with them, asking them their communication preference, but be sure to have a place in your database where you can easily record this, these pieces of information so that you have them. If Mr. Smith says, I only want to be contacted twice a year in June and in October, you darn well better be able to have a system to be able to track Mr. Smith's preference and to only mail to him in June and in October. Critical, critical. So here you just see a little screenshot. Gosh, I have to put on my glasses to look at that screenshot. I hope you all don't. But um, basically this is from a data entry manual that I crafted for that client that I was referring to. And you will see there are standards that I use based upon postal requirements. So North becomes N, Southwest becomes SW. This folks is directly from the US Postal Service. Um, then I outline how street names should use postal regulation street abbreviations or be spelt out completely. So you decide, but keep it consistent. Is it A-A-V-E or is it Avenue spelt out? You don't, I, it's a pet peeve of mine. I hate going into a client's database and seeing Av and then Avenue. Make it consistent. Um, cities or towns should be written out in full for me. NYC, write it up, New York City. So you need to go through and do something very similar within your organization, but have even the smallest standard written out so that there is no room for error. How do we write out a zip code? Do we use the zip code plus four if we can or don't we? And why do we do that? Well, postal regulations say mail will get there quicker if you do. So be, be very mindful of that. Again, those custom fields, some databases have no fields. Tim's gonna come in and talk to us about NEON at the end of this webinar and share a little bit about that. But here in those no fields or those custom fields, whatever your database may or may not have or the one that you're looking at, um, you can track things such as donor communication preferences, but also those contact records with donors. So interactions with the donors, date, times, type of contact, who contacted the person, what, what happened, what were the conversations, what are some action items, um, any correspondence that you send out to a donor, you want to be able to track. And that's an important one because when you mail out to um, your donor base, you want to be able to have something that says automatically inserted, um, we mailed calendar year end 2020. So that you know when you're doing a comparative analysis, how many mail pieces were sent out to that particular constituent group. And, right, you can start to figure out, okay, we mailed out, this is how many we got back, here is the response rate. A lot of these um, uh, metrics start to become easy to calculate if you go through these steps that I'm outlining in this webinar to, um, to ensure clean and consistent data entry. And again, check out Neon. Great piece of software to be able, I mean, they do custom to the max with their, Tim will talk about the different pro products that they have and the integrations that they offer. I, I have not seen a database like Neon to be so adaptable and flexible to the needs of its particular clients. So now that you have your data, it's, you know, you, you enter it in, you've got your systems for entering it in, you, you know who's entering in and how you, where are you keeping your donation information. Um, now you gotta keep it clean. Now that it's in there and you've got Av, Avenue for all your avenues, uh, you, you've, you dotted your I's and crossed your T's, now you've got to keep it clean. And there are different ways of keeping your data clean. And I'm going to provide you with some recommended reports that you consider running 
on a schedule of um, data cleanliness reporting or queries that I recommend all my organizations undertake. So of course, an easy one to do is a duplicate check and many of the database will let you know with bells and whistles that you have duplicates within your database. Um, be very cautious because sometimes online gifts, the way they're entered, can trigger a second donor record. The systems are getting much smarter these days. However, you do want to do checks and balances on online gifts and to see if they've created um, a duplicate record. Um, accidents do happen. Uh, don't send an extra appeal to the same donor. Oh, oh gosh, they're gone. Thank goodness we have these modernized database systems. I've been in fundraising now for, oh gosh, um, 25 years. And I remember the days before we had modernized systems. And um, gosh, duplicates were hard to find. And Mr. Smith got like three letters from us because we weren't using one consistent um, system. And we had spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> and we were merging the data into a bigger spreadsheet. And uh, we forgot, we didn't, our eyes couldn't catch the dedupe and Mr. Smith got three appeals. So here's the case for getting a database system. So understanding, here are some queries and reports that I recommend that you do on a regular basis to keep your data absolutely spotless, like Mr. Clean. So here's some examples. You may hear some examples of queries, and then we'll look at some examples of reports. Some queries that you may want to run, you want to look at donors and certain zip codes. Um, you may want to look at you know, the names of donors who gave to the annual appeal last time, last year, and do some spot checks. But more importantly, and you'll see them with bigger buttons there, some reports that you need to run. And I'm going to tell you when you should run them, monthly data quality review of all accounts created within the month. So, you know, let's say we're on, I'm on Wednesday the 25th of September, but you're all on Tuesday the 24th. However, in a couple of days on the 30th, I would recommend that you run all the accounts or records that were created within that amount month and go through and spot check the data quality. Are all the avenues spelt out? You know, are, you know, the four digit, uh, the zip code plus four, do you have all of that? Then I would also go through and run a list of, particularly if you're doing um, monthly reoccurring giving in your database is not alerting you because nowadays even some databases can do that, alerting you. And I know Tim is probably going to say there's an automation you can do with a neon that will automatically alert you to when someone's credit card is expiring and produce a letter to them. <laughs> That's how sophisticated Neon is. So be on the lookout for expired debit and credit cards. Uh, again, duplicate reports, that's self-explanatory. We already talked about that. But here's something that I like to look at for donor retention purposes. I like to keep my eye on that needle of donor retention. Um, so I highly recommend that you do a monthly lie bond. Who is about to lapse? Right, so if they're about to lapse, you want to take strategies to prevent that, prevent the donors from lapsing. Calendar year end is coming, it's a good time if you don't look at these reports monthly to pull a report of your lapsing or potentially lapsing donors and develop a strategy around them. This is how you use your database once you have the data clean. Um, transaction reports monthly to examine you know, campaign funds and appeals, make sure that you're entering in your campaign funds and appeals correctly, everyone is in the right place. Um, I highly recommend yearly that you look at who has access to your account. I manage a client's database remotely, I've been doing it, well, I've been doing it since 2016, um, the one that I developed the manual for. And they will email me and they'll say, oh, so-and-so left the organization three months ago. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, you've got a cloud-based system. Great. So be cautious and be, that's one report that people forget to look at. Who has access to your database? 
And you know, you may even want to do this more than yearly if you think there's some security breaches because donor confidentiality is critically important. And then relationship reports. How many of us think to actually look at the relationships in our database, mother to brother, you know, wife and husband, to make sure that they are accurate and to be able to add to those relationships if we can. I also highly recommend that you remove out-of-date queries. You keep up to date with your database training. You kind of know new features and best practices for those databases that I'm managing. I am always learning. Even today I asked a question, how do you do this with this particular piece? Um, subscribe to your provider's newsletter or blog um, and certainly um, you know, keep your data clean. I just can't emphasize, once you get it in there, you need to keep it clean. And one of the ways of keeping that data clean, I've, I've said it how many times throughout this webinar, have some kind of data entry manual um, or data entry stamps and that everybody has this manual who is going to be responsible for data entry, have a backup person, and make sure everyone is trained. Now, I have seen people who have come in, gone through all of those steps, they've appealed campaigns, funds, and appeals, they've you know, tried to enter in their data correctly, they may run some reports, although now we're starting to stretch it with how many people I see actually doing that on a monthly, quarterly, biannually, yearly basis. But most groups do not have a data entry manual. Why, Why do this? Because number one, garbage in is garbage out. If you do not have clean and consistently maintained data, you will not be able to pull the reports and do the analysis. And for me, I do not run a fundraising campaign. I said to someone this week, um, actually last week, I'm sorry, is, you know, I said, what's the goal for the campaign for you? What are you looking to raise? And not only what is the goal for your calendar year end, but what are the goals for some key metrics around calendar year end? How many new donors do you want to acquire? How many do you want to bring back into the fold? You know, so how do you measure that if you don't have clean data? And then, you know, how do you plan next year's strategy if you can't even measure that? So it helps you to set realistic and accurate fundraising goals. You know, maintaining that data integrity from year to year is a must and it keeps you organized. So here are some of the things that you need to consider when developing a database manual. Have a standard procedure for data entry. We already talked about what that could look like. I gave you a sample screenshot of that. Um, you know, a database manual will reduce mistakes and duplicates if you follow the processes. And it will help you to organize appeals and events in a consistent manner because you'll have, how do we, how do we structure campaigns, appeals and events should be one section of your data manual. And how do we, and what are the naming conventions for our appeals will be in that data manual. And how do we enable end users to find the information they need quickly? And I'm probably going to say that, um, you know, some of these things, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this to Tim in a, in a minute or two, but I'm wondering if some of the processes in a manual that once you develop the manual can be automated through NEON. So I'm gonna leave a question, question bomb for Tim over there. So you can, of course, email me for a sample manual if you want one. You're going to get my old clients one, but it'll give you a good sense of, um, you know, what should be in a manual and to use it as a template for yourself. But it really is a clear outline for organization. The main categories are in a data entry or data standards manual, profile management. How do we ensure data is entered consistently with those standards that I went over? How do we, we avoid duplication? And how do we regulate donor entry? And then you'll have a whole section on what I call transaction management. What are the campaigns, funds, and appeals? Um, and how do you find the information when you need it? Things like how do we run reports? How do we run queries? How do we enter in honor and memorial gifts, tribute gifts? Um, how do we do soft credits? 
Um, how do we enter in donor advised funds? Who gets the credit, who doesn't? All of these things are outlined in that transaction manual, transaction portion of your manage, your manual, transaction management portion of your manage, manual. And then you may have a section on inter what I call interaction management. So how do we produce gift acknowledgements? How do we um, acknowledge gifts online? What is, you know, what is the process there? What does that look like? Do they still get um, a hard copy acknowledgement? Um, and then how do we, you know, what are the letter templates? What letters do we use for what appeals or what campaigns? Um, how do we load them up into the database? Where do we find them? All of those kinds of things should be documented in some form of a manual. And then the last one, the last section of your database manual should be on what I call report management. So things like running reports on giving history, event history, donor interactions, all of those kinds of things, next steps with donors, how do you run those reports? How do you run queries? Number one, you need a query in order to produce a report in some databases. So how do you run commonly, um, um, uh, common queries and common reports step by step? So if someone were to come into your office and say, I need to find all the monthly donors, if that's important to you, you would have that outlined in your, um, in your in your manual so with that i am going to stop and turn it up oh, one oh, before i turn it over tim i added this slide in here yesterday i also in addition to a manual i also highly recommend that you have two important policies and procedures number one that you have a gift processing policy that's different than an acknowledgement process a gift processing policy is when checks enter into your office, who do they go to first? Do you make photocopies of them? Where do you keep them? Who gets them next? Finance, development, who gets a copy of the check? Whatever your processes are for processing donations or gifts, document it. Reconciliation. If you are not currently reconciling your database to your financial database, you need to start doing that. I know Neon has many integrations with um, counting software, but if, you're, if you don't have that liberty, and even then you still should do gift reconciliation, you need to have a procedure on when it's done, how you do it, um, and who is responsible for doing that gift reconciliation. So now I will turn it over to Tim. Sorry about that, false alarm, Tim. That is okay. Um, <laughs> wow, that was awesome. That was that was a lot of fun. Um, and and like like I even said before, uh, we kick things off, Robin. I like to to watch the presenters' uh, content and then adjust what I I want to talk about. And I have like so many different things I want to talk about. But the thing is, folks, that there is a question and answer um, capability in Zoom. So please, if you do have uh, any questions that you want to ask, uh, maybe you're your current Neon Serum user, happy to dive in and geek out about that. Or if you want some general uh, questions to be answered, please, we'll be paying attention to that. Um, what I want to do is is kind of do some big hits based off of what Rob and talked about today when it relates to Neon CRM. Um, and, and actually, uh, one of the questions is, how do you categorize appeals in Neon? So great question. I'm going to talk about that. Um, so a few things that I want to kind of hit on. Uh, first, how do we organize things like campaigns, funds, appeals, and what's the, 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 the language Neon uses for that? Uh, mm -hmm. I want to talk about duplicates, credit card reports. I want to touch on a bunch of different stuff, and luckily we are recording this too. So um, first and foremost, when it comes to just general campaign, fund, and, and uh, appeal structure, what you would do is you could get to this in a few different ways, but if you're just setting things up for the first time or you're trying to reorganize things, a good spot to go is global settings if you have the security permission controls to do it as a system admin. So going there is then going to bring you down to our allocation section right here. So campaigns, funds, and what we call purposes. 
Now, funds and purposes are actually going to be more for the reconciliation side of things. So we don't have something called appeal per se in NEON, uh, though we have thought about actually creating another extra field for that. But there's some reasons that I'm going to get into uh, on, on if we're going to do it, we want to do it differently than how everybody else has done it. So for all intents and purposes, the traditional appeal and campaign structure can be fully managed just under what NEON calls campaigns. So if we go into that and I add a new campaign, there's a few different settings I can also do, which is the campaign hierarchy. So notice 2018, and then we have some sub appeals under here. So for all intents and purposes, you can create the campaigns and appeals under what we call campaigns because you can assign them to a parent campaign. And so for Robin's examples, I would have it as it's the 2019, you know, annual appeal, it's the capital campaign, and then anything subsequently underneath, you'd be able to then nest it underneath here. Now, when you do reporting, you can actually have this kind of cycle upwards. So child campaigns or the appeals in this, in this case is what we're calling it for, for our webinar, uh, can roll up in reporting when you do this in NEON. So, so don't worry, you don't have to like mess with things a lot. You'd be able to actually structure that. Now, what's nice is that you can also assign automatic elements to this for funds. So notice we've defaulted it, and this is a, a, a best practice that I've done for a long time, is sit down with your finance team when you need to structure your funds and anything relating to account re accounting reconciliation, and basically say, like, what do you need this to be? <laughs> Just ask them. Say, what are your general ledger? Like, what are your, what's your chart of accounts? Let's align this. The other one is the purpose field. And a lot of times, this is where you can do more restricted designations. I've actually uh, started seeing and, and, and have been researching a lot around uh, activities in terms of the accounting nomenclature for activities. And that's just like a designation, perhaps based around a geographic location. So let's say you have three different facilities, like you're a YWCA or something like that. And you have, you know, uh, this building over here and that building over there. And if you wanted to make a designation for it, you can put it as a purpose. That's a good best practice. Uh, with QuickBooks, for instance, this aligns very well with the class field. And so funds purposes are not for the fundraisers, it's really the campaign stuff. Now, what's nifty though is during data entry, if I go ahead and actually add a no, new donation, and I can even look up people on the fly without creating a duplicate. Check this out. So if I actually designate it as a campaign, it auto fills the fund and purpose because of how I've structured the campaign, the appeal. All of those things can be auto populated. You can also add other fields in here like solicitation method to report on later. You can add some notes other types of things. You can also, if you do want your own special designations or, or data, you can actually create your own custom data relating to the transaction itself if you don't like how we do it. We like to come out of the gate and say this is the, the main stuff, but Neon is flexible enough to have those things done. Um, all right. Okay, I'm gonna get into a great question that I think Robin, you and I should share. Um, when it comes to solicitations from board members. But when it comes to a few other things, one main thing that I want to point everyone to is relating to the appeal and national change of address stuff itself. So if you go to your global settings, go down to third-party integrations and click, click certified yeah. integrations. This is everything that we've actually, just like we certified Robin and all the other Neon One consultants, we do the same with software. So if you see something in here, it is, it, it's cut, it's past the muster. So it is, it is absolutely certified and we've done it in a way that, that actually takes into account literally everything else in the database. Now, the one that I wanna focus in on is True Givers. Now, Robin, have you heard of True Givers? No, I have not. This is Roger Craver's brainchild. Oh, okay. What you do is you can get it connected, and this will do a national change of address oh. and review yes, of deceased yes, yes. records nightly, every Perfect. single day. 
every That's single right. day. It'll analyze the data and update the addresses for you. It will mark deceased records. It will even add some extra data as well. And all you have to do is hit create account here and you can get started. So definitely check that out. Um, other things that we actually just rolled this out over the weekend is a new way to analyze recurring donation schedules. So notice the expiration is easily listed here. Mm -hmm. But if you actually have enabled Neon Pay, the credit cards that expire will automatically update. So mm -hmm. the system will hunt for the expiration and update that on your behalf because the credit card company will supply us that information in a completely secure environment. So Neon Pay is our new payment processing offering that actually connects all Neon One products, not just Neon CRM, through a master login. I don't want to update my password, but I can manage applications including Neon Pay right from here. And that information will automatically end it. So that's the type of thing though, that if it starts to do that, you should write that down so people know that. <laughs> so I think a good best practice is when you're fleshing out your policies and procedures manual, even if there's something that's automated, one, don't rewrite vendor documentation. That's a big thing that I, I remember doing when I was working at my last job is we've already written it for you. You don't need to write down how to enter a gift mm -hmm. using Neon. Enter writing down how to use a gift, how you want the gift entered for your organization. Have a point to, to everything's in the support center here. Just point to URLs. Have it in a Google, a Google Doc so, you, so it's, it's living and breathing and you link to all the URLs. One of my favorite clients, Capital Roots, I'm doing a presentation with them tomorrow on data management, Robin, and I, and I got inspired by a bunch of stuff that, that you talked about. Oh, cool. We, they had their own version of, it was called No Nonsense Neon, and they put all their staff through a boot camp that went through the Neon One Academy, oh. and then also went through five years of data hygiene. Wow. So final thing, because I wanna get to the question that somebody submitted, is duplicate management. Not, now we, we, when it comes to the online gifts coming in, there's some stuff that Neon has, but we're actually doing a pretty intensive research project on what we can do to make that better. But even if you're using the system today, definitely use the widget around duplicates. All you'd have to do if you don't have that is just add new widget, search for duplicates, and it'll be there. And what this thing does is you can schedule the scanning on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis on any of these days. And so it will do email matches, address matches, do a few of them. We allow up to three automatically and just have it run like just have it do it for you and then you'd be able to simply go in there and say you know what i gotta merge some duplicates let's go and then you'd be able to merge these and look a bunch of this stuff doesn't look like it's actually duplicate duplicate so john and joe is that a brother is that a nickname that's some data hygiene stuff that sometimes duplicate management isn't going to be able to do okay robin i got a question for you from pamela okay. here if, yeah, you have, yeah. if you have board members who are also solicitors, how do you recommend maintaining their contact reports? Should they email to a staff member who enters the info or give access to the solicitor? Yeah. We're a small organization. Oh, this wow. question comes up all the time. That's such a great question. And I hopefully, Gosh. I want to make sure we answer that. I know we're at the top of the hour, so hopefully stay with us for a little bit extra time, folks. Robin, what do you think? Uh, I, just to even get board members to send back a call reports would be amazing in my eyes if you're a small organization. To me, it's always been like pulling teeth, but I would recommend keep it simple. You know, for me, uh, board members, the rate of them re reporting back to you what their contact notes have been, unless you have a superstar board of directors, is very slim to marginal, you know, it's, you're constantly calling them to figure out even if they even, I'm just being realistic here, mm -hmm. if they even made their visit, you know? So I would say, keep it simple. If you can get, and I don't, I'm, I don't know if I'm answering the question correctly or not, but get the information from them and enter it in on your end, probably would keep it the most simple rather than ever giving them access to your database. Because once you give them access, your data is never going to stay clean you know yeah. i would say only yeah. trained people who 
um, have been trained and the standards within your database should have access to it. I, I, I feel like a solicitor, especially a board member, is like, if you give them <laughs> access to the database, it's like letting the fox in the hen house. Right, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah, yeah. so a little thing relating to NEON that might be useful is you can actually create reports such as like an activity report and what you'd be able to do is under moves management, create an activity report and then filter it on that, like potentially that, uh, that board member, right? So uh, let's go under the prospect fields, for instance, and it would be, um, I don't know, you, you could do a few different things or system admins or something like that. And what you'd be able to do is actually create this report, have the output of the basic information on like, what did they do? You know, they can filter it on, you know, has it started yet? Has it not started yet, et cetera, and so forth. And let me actually just do like a very basic one. I'll, I'll just know that subject is, um, oh, I don't know, uh, containing golf. I'm gonna try that one. Let's see if we have anything like that. No, we don't, okay, bad, bad example, but, the idea is that what you'd be able to do is structure this and then you can actually share your reports so people can access them after the fact without um, having to log into the database. So then they'd be able to at least look at that report, have updated information specific to them, and then what I would do is write a little bit of a policy on how they're supposed to enter those contact notes and either create like I don't know, like a form through Google that you trust or, or Neon does actually have some survey capabilities if you wanna use that or just like give them an email template. Like I think that's perfectly fine. Like just make them do it through email and then that's all that, that's all that you would need to do. And there's ways that you can even track your interactions with the board member, uh, potentially even into the database if they're, they're doing it themselves. Um, so a nifty feature that you might wanna even uh, provide them as a board member is the BCC capability. And so if they email a prospect, you can actually get that email into the database, tracked. So give them this code, they don't need to do anything other than use their own email and add this to the BCC field and you're good to go. And you can even forward the replies, they could forward the replies. And it's not gonna like junk up your database if there's a bunch of emails, we filter this so it's not like overwhelming as well. Um, Awesome, awesome. So I know that we're a little over time and I can go on at length about any of this stuff, but are there any other final questions from folks in the crowd? I, again, I know we're over time, but this was such a, a delight to have Robin that, you know, for expertise that I would love to make sure that we answer any of your other questions. Great questions, by the way. And you know what it is, Tim? It's 25 years of errors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Personal. <laughs> oh, so many. Well, awesome. Well, folks, what we're going to do is going to, there was so much information. I want to make sure that this gets up today. So I'm going to work on, on uh, getting the recording up to our YouTube channel. We're definitely going to want to, uh, uh, you know, unpack this. If you want to get information from Robin, you know, drop her a line. Uh, we'll definitely be following up as well. And if you're interested in learning more about Neon CRM and the Neon One ecosystem, Robin, any, any final words before we let you go and hopefully you get a nap or something? Just no. <laughs> Just set it up right and keep it clean. <laughs> Love it. Love right? it. Well, that's great. Well, this was this was such a delight. Thank you so much for for joining us from all the way from Australia. Isn't technology amazing, folks? Oh, it really so, is. It really is. I'll be I'll be getting this uh, recording up today, and uh, we'll definitely be in touch. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks again, Robin. All right. Thank you, Tim. Bye bye.